Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today um, on AI and UX. Um, as you can see, we have a, a very special guest with us here today. Um, but before we formally introduce Jacob, um, I am going to talk a little bit about how you can interact with us uh, during the webinar. Um, so you'll see that you have both a chat box and a questions box. Um, feel free to, to introduce yourself in the chat box. And if you want to have some general chat, that's, that's the place to do it. Um, but if you have specific questions for Jacob or myself, if you could post those in the questions box, that would be great. Um, you'll also be able to vote for different questions as you see them there. So if there's a question you'd really like to hear the answer to, just make sure that you give it a vote. Um, we will save five or 10 minutes at the end of the event to ask uh, the top questions that haven't been covered. Um, so do make sure to keep an eye on the questions box. Um, I can see lots of people introducing themselves. It's great to see people from so many different places. Um, Make sure to share your LinkedIn profiles as well so you can all connect with each other. Um, but everybody is very welcome. Um, so just a little bit about us before we get started. Um, this event is brought to you by the UX Design Institute. We are a global leader in UX education um, and we offer courses for every stage of your UX career. Um, so we're going to share some links throughout the, the event to our courses um, and let us know if you would like to learn more. Um, we have a, a great team of um, education advisors who would be more than happy to speak with you. Um, but that's, that's it from us. I'm going to hand over to our CEO, Coleman, who is going to introduce Jacob for us. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this evening's webinar. Um, I am delighted to welcome uh, a true legend uh, of UX to our uh, to the webinar this evening, uh, Jacob Nielsen. Um, when I first started working in UX back in the late 1990s, uh, Jacob used to publish a regular newsletter called The Alert Box. And uh, it used to come out maybe two or three times a week. And when it used to come into our inboxes, um, it was read, it was shared, and it was discussed by everybody in our office at that time um, and uh, two three times a week so it was incredibly influential and the the role that i think jacob was playing at that time for or for us and for everybody in the industry was as a guide he was uh, guiding us and pointing us in the right direction as we all tried to figure out this new thing um, and that new thing at the time was, you know, how to design software for a mass market. Uh, uh, software had gone mass market because of the World Wide Web. And uh, Jacob was just a, a, a great guide and an, an incredible positive influence on uh, all of us and, and on my career uh, personally. Um, then Jacob went quiet for a while. The newsletter wasn't published for a um, good number of years. He was busy uh, running a successful business. Um, but I still used to read the columns. Uh, they were all collected on a, on a website called useit.com, and I used to refer to it, refer my colleagues to it, and my team. Even though some of those columns are 30 years old, they're still absolute gold dust, still relevant. Um, and, but he's back now. Jacob is back, uh, publishing regularly again. He's got a new website called UX Tigers. And, um, and when his columns come into our inbox now, it's the same thing happening. You know, uh, in the office, we all read them, we all share them. Uh, and we all discussed them. Uh, uh, so he's incredibly influential again, and he's playing the same role as we all try and figure out another new thing, which is how to design software in the era of uh, AI. And um, I'm delighted he's back uh, uh, because uh, along with everybody else, we need we, we, we don't know where we're going yet. Uh, so it's great to have somebody uh, uh, who can point us in the right direction. So um, without further ado, Welcome, Jacob. It's delighted to have you here, and uh, I'll hand you over to uh, Rachel. Um, and have a have a great evening, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. See you later. See you later. Um, well, Jacob, welcome. Um, it's uh, as yeah. Colin said, it's it's a real honor to to have you here with us. Um, so I guess I guess to start off, um, let's just jump right into what everybody's here to to hear about, um, which is all about AI. Um, so I'd love if we could just start off with, you know, maybe you could just tell us, and for anyone who's been living under a rock, 
where are we at with AI? You know, what what's currently happening? Um, you know, where where do you see this moment in time that we're at right now? Right. Well, I think we are in you know, year two of the AI revolution because it started really just last year. I mean, there were certainly certainly there's been AI going on for probably fifty years or so, but for the first many 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 years, it was just only a research project and. We always thought, oh, in 10 years it'll happen, and then 10 years later, oh, in another 10 years it'll happen. But then it actually did happen finally. So mm -hmm. I think that's the big, the big change. And it turns out that I actually just today published on my newsletter, Coleman was nice to mention, um, a survey of what UX tools that, uh, sorry, what AI tools that UX professionals use. And you mm -hmm. can see here that ChatGPT is just overwhelmingly the biggest. I mean, it's not even close to the number two, which is mid journey, which is an image tool. And you get perplexity, which is a question answering tool, I think is taken over from search. But, uh, and then quite a lot, much further down, you get actually UX tools like Wondering and FigJam and Miro and, and so forth. But all the big ones in terms of, this is again UX. I mean, there's been other people doing service of the general you know, consumer audience, and that actually looks very different. But for UX people, um, chat GPT is vastly the biggest and then come some other general AI tools. And I think this is because the quality of the AI itself is right now dominating. And so the GPT-4 level of AI, which is what chat GPT is offering and some other competitors are now about the same level, um, that is so much better than a kind of weaker level of AI that you sometimes see in some of the other tools. And of course, we're all hoping that there'll be like a level five coming out later this year, and that'll be even more exciting. But the point is that AI is still, even though as I said, it's year two of useful AI, it still in many ways has its, a lot of its of weaknesses. And that's why the strongest tools actually end up getting the, the most use. So ChatGPT, vastly number one, and then other tools, you know, much, much smaller, and then some UX specific tools. And if we look into the future, I would certainly predict we would get more specific tools as well uh, for all the various many things we, we do in, in this field. Yeah, um, thank you for that. It's 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 really helpful to kind of understand exactly where it's at. And interesting that you've you've just done that survey. We did something similar ourselves literally um, last week and, and saw the same thing that ChatGPT is just king right now. It's yeah. it's absolutely top. Um, and I, I know you've mentioned that kind of being down to to quality and that people are are really investing their time, I guess, in the in the tools that are ready to be used. Um, I'm just wondering if you could provide any insights into what are UX professionals using ChatGPT for? Um, you yeah. know, if 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 you can. Actually, it's a very very wide set of uses. Uh, some of them are, are text based, so it's like summarizing information rewriting information, translating. So one of the things we're seeing is that more international use in the old days, it was very expensive to do international studies. But I mentioned this, this tool called Wondering, which is a tool for doing user interviews, and they had translation built in. So you can actually interview users in other countries speaking other languages that you it would be hard to do in this type of interview we're doing now to people talking, but a user talking to an or typing maybe or could talk to an AI, that can be in any language, or at least in many languages. So internationalization is huge. And then you go down to things like Midjourney or other image tools, and you have people using it for uh, storyboarding, for mood boarding, for persona um, illustrations, also for a lot for prototyping, by the way. So you can mm -hmm. get, get content, you know, all this lorem ipsum, that did never again because even if you don't have like the final content, I would never recommend just copy paste out of chat GPT for your website. You've got to have some human editing, but for the first round, fine. You know, you can just ask and boom, it comes. And text, short text, long text. And that's another thing we know, you know, from many studies that online text should preferably be short. And it's very good at squeezing and making text shorter and shorter and shorter. And then again, because it's not perfect now, if it was for publication, you absolutely have to review it, make sure it didn't cut out some important thing or it didn't make up, this is called hallucination, it makes up something. So you wanna check about that. But again, for a prototype, and that's what is used a lot for now, 
but also for things like summarizing large amount of qualitative data. So in the past, it was a problem to do any kind of large scale uh, qualitative user research. I mean, if you measure something like how fast can people do something, you can like take a hundred people, a thousand people and just do a statistical, you know, what's the average. But if you have a thousand people typing in some comment, what are you gonna make of that? If you have a hundred thousand people, a million people, and I know of cases where they have that many, uh, what are you going to use? What are you going to do with that? You just cannot sit and read physically. You know, there's just not enough hours in the day to read all that information. And so, what you can do with AI, you can do a variety of things. I mean, so uh, one example I know of was to pick out important cases for you know the human UX people to pursue further. And this is like the needle in the haystack problem. And, and this is, a, by the way, also a good point of where the AI weaknesses don't matter so much. Because if you have a million cases and you've got to give me, let's say, 100 to review manually, maybe out of those 100, 20 are not important. They're like, oh, they're bogus. Well, you spend a little bit of time reading those. But compared to reading a million messages, you know, nothing, right? Also, maybe it missed a, a 20 you know, things also doesn't again also doesn't really matter because there was no way you would ever have found those 20 anyway in the old day but now at least you have 80 good things you couldn't pay attention to and and pursue with regular ux work for see if you can maybe redesign the product to avoid this is a classic example of sort of people commenting in support or help systems complaining about different difficulties they have and you could figure out where should we focus our redesign effort to fix something you know a bad problem uh, or if you have again thousands upon thousands of user comments classify them these are five different themes so thematic analysis which we used to do with like putting little sticky notes on on a wall right and sorting them manually uh, but again you can have the computer do it or the ai do it and then again it's recommended to review it and not just trust that these are the five things but but a lot of these applications are, are very very useful and also just for like your everyday everyday work like you know, rewriting an email to maybe sound a little bit more pleasant or, or shorter. Short is good, you know. So a lot of these okay. cases uh, people are using AI for right now. And then we can think about in the future, we can have better tools, but that's what you can do today. Yeah. And and the way you're speaking about um, AI right now, Jacob, it sounds almost like almost like an assistant, or I think you use the, the phrase starting point. Is that how you would recommend people to kind of approach AI at the moment? Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's a collaboration, a synergy or, or synergy effect, I guess is another a symbiont is one word I've sometimes used, like these kind of merged intelligences. Uh, mm -hmm. so AI can do a lot of things for you, uh, but it shouldn't be the one doing the final work. And on the other hand, you want to impose or add some human judgment and intelligence. So it becomes a combination, right? And the AI is right now, maybe a better analogy is like it's like a junior colleague or an intern or somebody who, who is not quite you know, the senior expert yet. Uh, maybe in five years, that could be different. But I still think in any case, it will be, we should consider the it, it AI as, as a colleague and have a, have a collaboration, you know, the handshake between the two types of intelligence. And AI is also great for creativity, by the way, which is something that maybe surprises many people because they thought, oh, computers cannot be creative. But for the actual studies that have been done, measurement studies have been done where you ask, you know, to come up with as many different uses for like some weird optics or whatever. AI comes up with more ideas faster than a human can. Not always the absolute best ideas, but a lot of them. And, you know, honestly, in ideation, quantity has its own quality. In other words, if you have many ideas, that's right, there is a benefit. And this is, by the way, if I want to give you like just one piece of advice to the audience for how to use AI, is to never be satisfied with just one answer. Always ask it to do three or five or 10. Like if you're even just writing a headline for an article, you say, give me 10 ideas for, an, for a headline for this article. And then maybe you don't use any of those 10, but you stitch together, you know, bits and pieces or, or you know, write copy for, well, if you're just doing the prototype, maybe just say, give me the copy and you do it in the prototype. But if you want to do, do UX writing for like an actual actual you know, website or, or any kind of real product, um, you know, ask it for to do a many, many versions and ask it to do also in a, in a variety of styles. I mean, you can sort of 
narrow it a little bit with the general style you want that's your you know tone of voice but you can still ask it to do some variations uh and then again you can pick and you i mean that's again the human judgment so you pick what you think is actually the best but of this wealth of ideas that it generates for free i mean compared to having like you know 10 high paid ux people in a room trying to bang out you know ideas for this that is so expensive and the ai does it doesn't need to have an hour meeting it can do it in like 10 seconds and you have 10 ideas yeah and i think i think the way you know you've you've spoken about it there i love i love the idea that you know it's it's a starting point and then there's the layer of the the human on top of that and that we right, then right. have to use our discernment i guess to um you know to to select what is or isn't useful um which i think is 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 great but but like you said it is really a, a great thought provoker if if only that initially um you know to get ideas started um you know there's nothing worse than looking at a, a blank page sometimes and i think that's where that gpt has it's has always really easier to edit it's always easier to edit and it's even easier to pick from 10 different versions even if none of them are exactly what you want but you can stitch together the final mm -hmm. result yeah absolutely um so you you mentioned the word limitations a couple of minutes ago and i just wanted to to come back to that so you know if chat gpt is is where we're where we're interacting most because it's it's um most ready for prime time i guess um what limitations have you seen of other tools or what limitations do you see for ai currently well the i mean there's a variety of limitations and and one limitation is very famous i don't need to have on it so much but that's those famous hallucinations which you've got to check that it's true it's just not making up something um another limitation is that it doesn't always give you exactly what you want this is particularly true for image generation tools probably also for video generation tools even though there's not as much experience with those and so what we often find is that you cannot get a picture of the exact thing you kind of envision Sometimes you can, but but often you cannot. It'll just give you other things. But then again, because it has its own creativity, sometimes it comes up with, wow, this is a picture I would never have thought of, but that's actually pretty good. So you, you have to actually kind of, in some sense, accept the limitations and play with it, which is to say, if you want an exact picture to look exactly like this, you may have to commission a human artist to draw it. But if you just want a good picture, you can get it at like a tenth of the price or one percent of the price. Uh, you just cannot necessarily get the exact thing you wanted. And also iteration is is huge. And so this is where right now there's quite a quite limitation, honestly. They have things like in in in, in painting, which is you can select a part of a picture and say, draw this little bit again. The rest is fine, but this corner is wrong, and it can it can make that make that again. But uh, it's it's kind of weak. It doesn't quite have the ability for you that you would have with a human artist. Like this is like art directors are famous for. It's like okay, do it again, but this time in this way, right? And you can't really do that with with uh, the image tools. You can do a little bit more with the text tools. So iteration and text tools is a little easier because they have a little bit more intelligence, as I said, like ChatGPT and and other similar level uh, intelligence has a little bit of ability to understand what you want. But even then, if it's drawing something, I mean, honestly, like I was just doing this uh, two days ago, I, I want like you know, a funny cartoon to put into a little story. I'm doing about five people presenting something together. I was saying five people crowding the podium. That's going to be a busy session. That was kind of my little joke. And the thing draws seven speakers. I'd say, I want a picture of five speakers. And by the way, one of them is a woman because it's all men. So anyway, it draws another picture. Here is a picture of five speakers, four men and one woman. No, it was six speakers. I mean, honestly. So it doesn't always really follow directions. And so there's that's, I think, is, is a downside. And I don't think that's going to continue. I think that's prompt adherence is one of the things that they will probably very much work on. Mm -hmm. in future version and the last thing i do want to mention because now i'm getting kind of upset about this which is uh <laughs> the user interface the usability is honestly often substandard it's amazing that things that we have known for 30 years or more are often violated in these like big big tools that have lit literally billions of dollars in investment in them and yet they, they ship so lousy products in terms of the actual UI. 
Now again, the user experience, which again, which is user the controls and UI plus you know the content and the, and the entire experience, uh, it's strong enough that people will use them because you can get things like ten ideas for for free in ten seconds, so you can get a picture that's you know vastly more beautiful than I could ever draw. I, it just sits it out. It can take this long text, summarize it. I mean, all the things I just talked about, it can do, and for very, very little cost. I mean, these things are very cheap tools, actually, compared to what they can do for you. So that's why people use them. But if you think about the controls, the commands, I mean, Midjourney is notorious for having a really bad user interface, but um, ChatGPT actually as well. It's just like lo one long scrolling list and no real good support for things like uh, pointing out like it's the second paragraph I want change. You have to like describe it in the second paragraph. Please like, make this change rather than like, point and click and use menus and graphical user interface. Come on, right? It's like the Macintosh. Uh, we had the 40 years anniversary of the Macintosh. For 40 years, we've known how to make you know at least reasonably good user interfaces. Maybe I'm never satisfied. Maybe it's never like perfect user interface, but we know how to do pretty good anyway user interfaces. Mm -hmm. And yet, out the door, because now that's a new generation. But honestly, this is history repeating itself, because as Coleman was saying in the introduction, like back in the, when the web came out, a lot of things we knew about how to do good design, out the door on terrible websites for the first several years. So it's just history repeating itself. Yeah, so, so usability is definitely lacking in these AI tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to come back to the usability in a second, but before that, I just want to pick up on something you mentioned, which I think is is really interesting, which is almost that, you know, there's a skill to using these tools too. Like you've given us some some great recommendations there around how to better interact with, with ChatGPT, for example, asking it to give you multiple ver versions, things like that. Um, but it's it's a skill for us all to learn, I guess, in in how to get the most out of these tools as they currently exist. Um, but yeah, I guess the the usability issues of, of these tools is a perfect kind of segue for me to ask a little bit about where you see the role of, of UX professionals in this kind of revolution of, of AI. Of course, there's no better group to, to tackle this, um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, I definitely think that specifically for the AI tools, they need to take usability seriously. They need to staff up like some seriously big UX teams because it's not easy. So that's their their excuse. I mean, to their credit, I mean, not their credit, but to excuse them. It is not easy to design an entire new paradigm of interaction. And this is a new paradigm, by the way. So, uh, you know, for the last many years, we had the graphical user interface, but that was actually only a subset of a bigger you know, thing, uh, paradigm, which was command-based interaction, which is basically always, ever since we got rid of batch processing, command-based interaction has been the way we use computers, which is, I tell the computer what to do, do this. I click this icon, I pull down this menu, I maybe type in, if you're using DOS, I type in this command. In any case, do this. Computer, yes, sir. It does what it's told. This is very happy. But it does exactly as it's told. And we all know that sometimes we tell the wrong thing, right? Because it's too difficult. But that was command-based interaction. That's what we've had for like, you know, about 60 years now. And then with AI, we change into what I call intent-based outcome specification. So you tell it, you know, I want a rabbit on a bicycle passing out Easter eggs or some, whatever you feel like you want a picture of. You don't tell it, you know, click here, draw an oval, click here, make furry thing. I mean, you don't tell it any of that, which you would do if you did it in Photoshop. You just tell it what I want. That's the outcome, the intent, what I want it to do. You tell it your intent and it complies as good as it can and it's not perfect yet. And, but, but that's what it does. So it's a very different interaction style. And really designing for that is not something we really know what how to do. And, and that's why the current systems are terrible and that's why they need a lot of UX work. Now, that's what are the tools, but of course, that's just a tiny, tiny percentage. The vast majority of the value created by AI is consumer surplus, not being gathered up by, you know, OpenAI and those companies. They'll make plenty of money, you know, not, not worry. But I mean, the, the vast majority of the value comes from the use. And for a lot of, lot of applications, whether they are specialized applications of the existing tools, like, you know, they have this thing called GPT, which is a kind of like little mini agents you can build within ChatGPT, or it's 
just completely regular tools that get an AI, you know, components. Like an example that I heard about recently is uh, language learning from a company called Duolingo, and that's a famous language learning company. And so they have now added some AI features so you can like, you know, have a conversation and practice your French or practice your Japanese or whatever language you want to practice with uh, this this AI. And uh, there's a like, they, they did a talk about, a uh, presentation about it at a Figma conference recently. So that YouTube is on YouTube and it's worth watching that video. But the challenges they had anyway in like integrating this AI into that application of language learning, which would be completely different. And if you want to integrate it into, let's say, a farming application for how to apply fertilizer best when the farmer is driving the tractor out of the field. And by the way, this is expected to like cut a lot of pollution in half because you can have much more precise dosing of fertilizer with AI use. So you know, complete, I mean, th those two applications couldn't be any more different. And so the usability and UX issues are very different in those two uh, scenarios. And that's what our what would we you know have to work on. And uh, the people you know on, on on this call today are watching watching the video or whatever. I mean, the very hopefully a few of them will will go and get jobs at OpenAI and wherever because they need it. But the majority of the people will be using AI in very in other applications, not in an AI specific tool, but in applications that get an intelligent part to it. And for sure, everybody will be using AI just in their own work. Because one of the things that we know from a lot of the studies that have been done so far is that AI vastly improves productivity of knowledge workers. Not just a little, right? I mean, in, 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 in my experience, you know, like if we had like a really great design, we could maybe improve people's productivity by like five or 10% or something like that. But this is like 40%, four zero. And that's now where the tools are still not really that great. And so my prediction would be that if you look ahead, I don't know, five years or so, we may be talking sort of like doubling, which means that you can get twice as much work done with AI as without AI. And so mm -hmm. there's a variety of, of sort of conclusions from that. And the first is uh, many people have been saying this already, but is you're not gonna lose your job to AI, but you will lose your job to somebody who uses AI if you don't, because if you have two people same talent, let's just say, but one gets twice as much work done in a day, who you're gonna hire, the person who gets twice as much work done. This is obvious. So the person who does not use AI, they have no future. And so this is actually true for basically any knowledge work, but specifically for UX is certainly true. And so this means you better get with it and start learning how to use AI. And if you have not done it, uh, well, it would have been better to do it last year, start last year, because then you already have one year's experience now. But, you know, that's too late if you haven't done it yet. But start now. And so one of my, my kind of advice is start small, but start now. Because if you put up a grandiose plan for, like, doing a huge project, it's going to be, first of all, it's going to be too scary and too intimidating. And secondly, you're probably going to use it wrong. Because as Rachel, as you mentioned before, you know, there's a skill to how to use these, these tools. And you've got to learn it. And so start small, but it's a very small thing. Maybe so small as just like rewrite a headline for an email. I mean, that's like, it can't be much smaller than that, but you know, copy paste the email into chat GPT, so give me 10 ideas for a headline or subject line for this email. Can't be any smaller than that, just write like five words. Uh, start small, but start now. And then you build up that experience because then in five years from now, you will have five years experience with AI use in, in UX. And of course, you know, over the years, you will grow to do much more fancy and advanced things. Um, and that's what, what will be needed. And oh yeah, one more thing actually. So I mentioned like, if you don't, if you don't use AI, you're probably really going to be out of a job. But, but some people are worried about, well, you know, what about like, if, if people can do, have twice the productivity, does this mean we need half the number of, of staff, right? And yes, in one under one condition, and that is that you only have a certain amount of work that needs to be done in the world. But that is false. That's that's called the fixed work work fallacy. And this is false because that's not a fixed. I mean, this is actually true for any anything, but it's particularly true for UX. It's not true that there's only the amount of UX work done now is what the world needs. The world needs vastly more UX work. And there's so, I mean, for two reasons, actually. A, 
there's so many bad design, bad experiences, hard to use things in the world now that need to be fixed. That's number one. Number two is actually even more exciting, which is there'll be a lot of new things coming out that now, I can't say today what's going to be invented in, in three years, but I can say is what I know based on all human experience for 10,000 years. And when something has been true for 10,000 years, it's probably will be true for another five years also, which is that people invent new things all the time. And so there will be new things and they will be in even more need of UX because they'll be even more complex and advanced and, and need, need, need to good design. So I feel like UX has until now been somewhat of a luxury and people don't like me to say that, but but it is rather expensive. It's kind of like bespoke. It's sort of like, um, you know, if you look at, you know, I guess, like if you look at King Charles and he will always wear like a really nice suit, right? So made by some very expensive tailors, handmade just for the, for the king. But that's not realistic that every person in the world can have a custom made suit or many custom-made suits. It just is too expensive. And so UX is a little bit like the king's suits right now because they're cu it's custom-made. You make everything by hand for every design project. And it takes a lot of staff hours, human hours, to create a good design because it's not easy being simple. Simple is, is hard. So anyway, so if we can double our productivity, let's just say, this means that the price of any given design is now half of what it used to be. That means more people can now afford to good, 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 good design. And as I said, the, the need is, it's not infinite, but it's, it's enormously more than it is now. So my, my personal prediction is that in, uh, in 10 years, there'll be three times as many UX people in the world as there are now. Um, so we are now about 3 million UX people in the world. And I predict we'll be like um, nine to 10 million people in the world in 10 years. So I think, I think honestly, it's not to worry about jobs. I don't know. I cannot say, oh, this job will be created in three years. I cannot say that. But I can definitely very, very confidently predict that a lot of new jobs will be created. So I don't think anybody should worry about being more productive means that you'll be fired or, or half the people will be fired. No, they'll do just they'll do twice as many things because there's a need for more than twice as many things, which is why I predict they'll be even even more UX people. And now and when it's cheaper, it gets done more. This is all honestly basic, basic economics, you know, that you learn in like whatever first first day and you take any economics course, they'll teach you that price sensitivity curve. If something is cheaper, people buy more of it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that, Jacob. I think it's it's such an important point because I think that has been the fear that, okay, if AI can make us twice as productive, does that mean there'll be half half the work to do? But I think what you're saying is so true that it just opens up the potential for so much more to be done. It's not like we're gonna consistently do the same level we're doing now, we'll do even more. And I guess that's where the opportunity comes and and really it makes, you know, from listening to you talk there, you get excited thinking about the future of, yeah. of UX and yeah. and how much more widespread it will become as it becomes more possible for, for more companies, more industries to really embrace UX. Um, and I loved your advice as well about, you know, starting small, but start now. And I think that's really important because it can feel a little bit overwhelming. You know, so much is happening and so quickly and there are new tools nearly every day. Um, but I think that's that's great advice to, to just get started. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I guess I guess the next thing I have to ask is is about the the ethical side of all of this and and I, I saw in the chat as well there was a little bit of conversation in that particularly around image generation and and what that means for um, you know uh, intellectual property I guess or or you know um, that kind of that kind of thing um, I wonder if you could give your perspective on the ethical elements of AI and and where you think the industry is with that right now and and where we need to get to. Right, right. Yeah, I think that that learning from existing examples, I don't actually think that's unethical because that's how human learns anyway. Uh, and that's why the copyright law is you can't make the same thing, but you are absolutely allowed to have learned and experienced from whether you go to art museums or you 
talk to other people when you're in preschool <laughs> or you, they don't have like the copyright on the words they 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 use the other kids and you learn to use those words as well you know for better or worse you learn you learn from from experience and that's the same as the AI, AI tool does um, I feel like it's it really is a tool and and uh, the creator is still the human who is um, directing the tool and who is selecting from the output and is modifying. And remember again, iteration is a very, very big thing. So I really feel that that authorship still exists in the AI era. I don't think it's, oh, you just press a button and, and it's done. Um, and, I, and and also it's not that you press a button and it just comes out the, the same. I mean, it could, and that would definitely be a copyright violation, right, if it came out. And I do see people sometimes do this, that they generate, you know, pictures of Batman without permission. And, and that I would that's completely a copyright violation. But to me, that's not actually um, necessarily a new thing about AI. I think a lot of the things that people are complaining about are things that they should complain about, whether it's done with, with or without AI. Uh, like, for example, these uh, you know, fake porn movies where you, I mean, honestly, it's in any case, I hope anyway, <laughs> illegal to make fake porn movies with other people who have not consented to be in the movie and just have pasted in their 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 face or something like that. So with an AI, maybe it looks a little little better, but honestly, if you do enough special effects, you can make anything happen in, even without AI. So so these things, I mean, co copying somebody else's stuff, uh, making a fake porn video, making, let's say, a politician say something they didn't say. I mean, all those things are unethical whether or not you use AI. I mean, if you just write an article and say, no, the prime minister said such and such that they didn't say, I know that would be wrong. It, it doesn't really matter whether I get it from chat GPT or it just comes out of my typewriter. It's an, an, an ethical in any case. Um, so I think that, that the, so the standard human ethics, I mean, in many ways really should apply in any case. And I mean, I'll, another example, so I'll, okay, so I'll take you my, my trusty shop here. There's absolutely no AI in that thing. And I will, I will draw the little picture for you, right? So we get here. So we get a picture of a circle and we get some other circles here. And I don't know if you actually think this looks anyway like Mickey Mouse, but but the point is anyway that that um, that's allowed on the fair use of copyright because uh, I'm using it for educational purposes, for critical purposes. It's not taking any business away from Disney. It's not, I'm not making a comic strip on animation, which people could do, which would be wrong. Um, and it's not taking any business way. I'm not pretending that it's from that company. There's a variety of rules in, in fair use in the copyright law. And I actually don't want the AI tools to put themselves as judges as to what the artist or the creator can or cannot do. Um, I mean, the law should be in, in charge of that. And if you violate somebody's copyright, you know, there should be a complaint about it and it should be ruled, you know, not allowed. But I don't want the software to do that for you. And I feel like there's a little bit of a tendency. And the worst example is actually the, the Google AI that came out recently, which put it, itself so much above the human that it started like lying to people, showing people things that were historically wrong. It started saying, oh, it's not ethical. It's some, somebody was like, trying to write, get it to write an advertisement to sell their goldfish and say, oh, it's not ethical to sell living creatures. Well, some people may, may be you know, sufficiently hardcore vegan that they don't like you to sell a goldfish, but other people are not. And so the point is the, ethic, the ethics of selling or not selling a goldfish could be debated for hours, but it's not the job of the computer to put itself in judgment of human humanity. Humans need to be in charge of the computer. To me, that's actually the most fundamental ethical point at all about AI is it needs to stop trying to judge us. It needs to be a tool. And then if people with humans use the tool for an ethical purposes, it's because the human is wrong, right? And then there are rules against that. And, and the rules we've had in the old in the old world, we already had for whatever number of years, depending on what it is, but there's a lot of rules and just plain you know, decency and laws and a whole range of those things exist already. And to me, whether you're using AI or not is not really the point. The point is, are you being ethical? Are you treating people well? Even that little goldfish, are you treating the goldfish well or not? Now that's an issue. 
but I don't want the AI to tell me that I can't sell my goldfish. You know, that's not its job to be, to put itself like a like a thought police thought crime, like in the old oldest old science fiction story. I mean, thought crimes are not the job of you know some people at Google to decide what humanity should do or not do. It's not that's not their job. The job is to make a tool that's useful, and then we'll decide what we want to use it for. And I know some bad people will use it wrong. And I do feel, by the way, that if you think about like the police or the kind of law enforcement type of people, um, they probably should take it more seriously to crack down on some of these crimes, like uh, a lot of like the phishing and spam and those type of things. They're not taken seriously enough because, oh, it's just people sending email. But honestly, it's it's reducing the, the, the quality of life dramatically for people all over the world because we are not doing enough to stop. I mean, you can never stop, stop like nothing, but you could probably reduce it a lot if this was taking more, those t those type of comp computer crimes were actually taking more seriously because it's maybe a small impact on any one person getting it, but then it's a billion people doing it. So the total amount of suffering you're imposing from these people, and that that is unethical, but not actually AI, but it will be worse with AI, I'll admit that. And so therefore it needs to also be, be um, dealt with more more forcefully, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's a really good point because what I've noticed is kind of these questions around trust concerns or eth ethics concerns, you know, they're reducing some people's willingness to engage with the tools and kind of putting up these barriers. And I think it's really important what you've said to remember that it's actually the job of humans, of, of us, to write the rule book for what these tools will do or won't do or how we how we interact with them. Um, but I, I take your point as well that there there could certainly be there's lots more to do when it comes to to, to writing those rules I guess and and something we need to figure out. Um, uh, I also want to ask you a little bit about personalization. Um, before I do, just a reminder to everybody: I can see lots of questions in the chat, so we're going to leave 15 minutes at the end. Um, to to look at some of those, but just a quick reminder to everybody: don't forget to to vote for the questions. Um, you, you really want to hear the answer to because I'll be looking at the at the top voted ones in, in a couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, Jacob, before we move on to, to the audience questions, um, I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about personalization, what that means, I guess, for anyone who doesn't know and how AI can, um, you know, move us along in, in, in terms of personalized experiences. Absolutely. So I actually have a very nice little picture for that as well. So let me show you that. Um, okay, so here we have a picture that sort of symbolically shows all the all the possible users. And one of the first things I learned when I started in user experience is we have the target audience. So we just, there are a lot of people we don't care about, we just knock them out. So now we have the target audience. We design for the target audience. That's one way. You don't design for everybody because you cannot design for everybody and you're designing for nobody. Okay, target audience, but that's a lot of people and they're quite different. So the next step was personas. So we divide up the target audience, in this case, three different personas, who are people who use our software in different ways, and we design for those personas. However, a persona can easily be millions of people for a big website. And so now comes the next step, and that is we say a specific person, like we're designing exactly a user interface exactly for this woman. And so that is, we're just, so it started, you know, before I started, so more than 41 years ago, the notion of the target audience is very old. So we take everybody, target audience, personas, individuals. So individual design is how we really can optimize usability. Now, how do we do that? Okay, so there's a variety of old school ways of doing it already, which are customization. That is, we give people choices. Do you want it this way or that way? That set to say doesn't work very well because most people do not go into the preference settings. And if they do, they don't know how to make them work well. But some, sometimes you can do customization to allow some more expert users to optimize their own personal experience. Personalization is when the computer, so customization is the user decides on, on choices. Personalization is the computer optimizes for you. And now with AI, it can do it in a much more elaborate and fancy way. Um, and so really create custom. So we have something called generative UI, a generative, it's just like generative image making. I make a new picture. Well, I can make it, make a new user interface exactly for you, for me, for the one person. And that has a lot of different uses. And, and it's not 
right now it's more of a vision than it's reality. But I mean, there are a few few examples I'll I'll mention. So one of them comes from uh, from e-commerce from fashion websites. So, you know, if you go to a site that sells clothes, you know, it'll it'll have a pic. You 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 can't touch it. That's a major downside of e-commerce. You can't try it on, but you can see a photo of a person wearing this suit, for example. And that gives you some idea of how it's going to look for you. But speaking just personally, you know, like I'm a somewhat short, you know, sort of bald, a little bit overweight person. So uh, the models <laughs> never look like that, I'm sorry to say. So it's hard to envision 100% how the suit is going to look on you. Uh, so actually, Google introduced something called virtual try on, and that's an AI feature where they map. Uh, the clothes, in this case, a suit, or it could be a dress, or it could be you know, a shirt, whatever it is, if they map that on to a representation that's more like the, us the user. So it's not like 100% accurate yet, but again, like five years, or even maybe only two years, and it will be. So you could actually see how it will look for you to, to wear this piece of clothing. And that, of course, will, first of all, it's going to reduce returns, which are very, very expensive for e-commerce, but it probably also increased sales because people will feel more confident. So that's a great example of individualization. I mean, it's kind of personalization to the max. Um, another example that's just sort of happening now is mid-journey. They have kind of a style feature where they draw the pictures in certain styles and they are working on now. So we have, I don't have, I haven't tried it yet, but they're working on making the style, stylization based on the images that you have liked. So if you go into Midjourney, they have all these pictures that other people have created and you give like a little heart to things, you say, well, that looks good. And if you do that enough, eventually it's start, gonna start creating images that look more like the images you, you, you like or the images you already upscaled or you, that you use that it knows that this I liked, this I did not like. And it's gonna create more like that. So that's more like a hope. We don't really know how well that's gonna work, but I think that's kind of very promising. And the last example I mentioned, which is also more on the hope than is current technology, is uh, to help um, users with various disabilities. Because right now that's done through an accessibility approach that honestly doesn't really work very well. Um, but if we can create a personal, you know, individual user interface just for that person that takes their problem into account, like, so maybe this person is completely blind, cannot see a thing. Well, in that case, it has to be a spoken auditory user interface that we can create. Uh, other people may have difficulty pointing to things very precisely, so motor skills impairments. Other people, this is like the biggest accessibility problem in the world right now is actually literacy. So we have a lot of people who are not very strong readers. And if we give them complicated content, it just, they don't, don't understand it. And so again, that's one of the things we can actually do even, even now that uh, tools like ChatGPT can rewrite information to be simpler. And that's done actually in some medical offices now. So, so we actually know from research that have been done that when patients leave a doctor's office, many of, of these patients have no clue what really happened, what the real diagnosis was, what the doctor really recommended should be done to, to help them get better. Um, and they get like a sheet with the instructions and it's too complicated for them to read it. So, uh, so that's now, but uh, that can be better. We can rewrite it to be, to be simpler, to be at that person's level. So that ability to individualize the user experience, I feel like enormous potential, um, whether it's for like selling more or it's for helping you know, people with uh, disabilities more, uh, of course, the most famous maybe right now example of, of disabled users is the Neuralink. That's a different type of AI. But this notion that you get something implanted and then you can just think about something and, and the computer will understand it. That's right now, like I think that only one person has had that implant yet. So that's really definitely only a experiment. But I think also very promising. So, so I feel like there's a lot of potential for departing from the traditional model of you no know, one size fits all because it doesn't, because humans are so different. Yeah, thank you for those those examples, Jacob. Um, I, I particularly like the example of the um, the clothing being you know being able to see what it would look like on 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 us because uh, it's always a surprise when the clothes arrive and they don't look exactly like they did on the model. Exactly. Um, but I, I I love also the the you know 
the aspirations around um, accessibility and and being able to individualize experiences and kind of meet people's specific needs, which I think, again, I'm sure everyone like me who is listening is just getting excited about these these possibilities. And um, you can just see the kind of limitations we would have had up until now kind of melting away, I guess, with with yeah. with some of this. Um, so I'm I'm going to jump in then and and ask a couple of the most popular questions from from the the chat. Um, so there's the question here um, from Luke and Luke is asking, how do you think AI? Um, sorry, the questions are jumping around because people are so ferociously voting. Um, how do you think AI will change user journeys from the beginning of a journey? So instead of using Google to find a product, do you think people will just ask their agent or co-pilot or or what do you think? I absolutely think so. Uh, and you notice that that chart I showed in the beginning with the most popular tools, the number three most popular tool is perplexity, which is actually an answer engine or an AI that answers your questions. So I think that's replacing search. Now it's replacing it more so for people like us because we're like more cutting edge, whereas for the general public, it's still ranking a good deal lower, uh, but it's happening anyway. And it's so much better in many ways. One of them is that it also a little bit predicts what else you would you would need in addition to what you ask for. So basically what these AI tools is doing is they are writing a customized answer just for you. And again, as I mentioned before, it could be written at you know an academic reading level is for somebody like me who is like overeducated person. It could be written in a very, very simple language if it's for a low literacy reader. Um, but it doesn't just answer my, my question. It starts to think, oh, these are other things you might also like to know. And it co co combines this information because it, you know, it, it has read the entire internet. Uh, and then it combines, compiles a little mini article just for you with what you asked about and other things you also might like to know. And then you can also ask follow-up questions. So it's, it's a vastly superior experience to using a traditional, um, traditional search. And that is true that that begs a lot of questions for websites that are used to getting a flow of traffic from search. And one of the downsides is that that may um, diminish. It not, will not go away because they do provide sources. So they say, you know, if you want to know more about this, and there's like footnote one, footnote five, footnote, you know, whatever many footnotes they have. And you can click on them and you can go to that website and, and read more about that issue but because the answer is actually pretty good it's relatively rare that you need to do that so i don't like to have a statistic on exactly how often people do it but i bet you that it's a substantially reduced by substantial i mean less than half probably more like a quarter or less than a quarter of the clicks you would get from answer engines compared to from search engines so that will definitely change uh, change the customer journey, the starting point for the customer journey. Um, at the same time, there will also probably in the so this is now. Now in the future, one of the big things a lot of people are predicting is these, these more agent-oriented tools that may go out and, for example, in the case of e-commerce, look for a lot of providers, a lot of vendors, uh, understand more of the terms and conditions and prices and what's available, what range is available, what colors are available, whatever. And then again, present to you uh, some recommendations or possibly in some cases, even just like do it for you. Like um, like a simple example, if, if, if it knows that I'm eating certain things for breakfast every day and it has some sensors in the refrigerator in my kitchen, wherever in the nose we're running low on something, it could just place the order or no to 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 get to get it. I don't even know. It just it just comes as I never run out of of um, no almonds or whatever it might be that that I need. Uh, so I, I think that you could you could see a fair amount of those things, and that may mean that the science may actually have to now cater to two types of users, which are human users and these agent or robot users. Um, again, it's a little bit uncertain exactly how that how that will happen. But what I would recommend for sites that are more say content sites as opposed to transaction sites, is to emphasize more user loyalty. And uh, you know, like things like an email newsletter. I mean, email is the oldest media form on the internet, and yet it survives. And it's actually in many ways the best way of reaching customers because it's what Seth Godin calls it permission marketing. Like if um, the customer's given you permission to go and populate the inbox, 
that's a huge, you know, buy-in or, or, or permission that that customer has given you. And of course, you shouldn't abuse it. You shouldn't send them, you know, spam or too much bad stuff. But but if you have the permission to go and put stuff in people's inbox, that's a way of keeping that connection alive. You cannot rely on them coming in from search anymore. Um, so we've always had like merit. We have had like also we have social media and social media may actually also be a little bit of a decline just because it has too many almost like mental health negative effects sometimes. So maybe social media may or may not be as big in the future. Search will definitely get smaller. So we need something else. And I would say permission marketing, uh, which again, that is a 20 year old idea, but uh, an email itself is 50 years old. But even just because they're old doesn't mean that they're not good ideas. And I, I really feel, would recommend emphasizing more things you can do to foster loyalty among users rather than relying on a fire hose of incoming users that you then oh most of them go away but a few of them convert uh, so conversion rate may actually become less important than loyalty rate you know returning mm -hmm. customer yeah i think that's it's you've made some really really good points there and and again you know thinking about the the impact of if if that start of the customer journey does change and we're not coming through search you know like you've said there's huge implications there for what we know right now and and what businesses rely on so again it's it's exciting stuff and and lots of change ahead um we have just um just under five minutes left so there's Two more questions I'm going to try and get through here that have gotten a lot of votes. The first is asking about AI having bias and and is that a limit working with AI? I know we we touched at the the start of the conversation on limitations, but um, since lots of people are very interested in this topic and it's this question is still getting lots of votes, I wonder maybe if if Jacob you could just kind of sum up, you know, your point of view on that and and you know. Um, how can we work with AI and accept the fact that there is some bias there, but move forward anyway, I guess? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I feel like the AIs we have now derive their knowledge from having read the internet. That's how they have learned. I mean, humans, we've learned our knowledge from talking to other people and reading some books and reading a small percentage of the internet, but the AI has read the entire internet. And therefore, it has picked up things from there. And there's a variety of ways in which that um, manifests itself. So one of the ways, for example, is, is in language. And so now, right now, we're speaking English. And, and AI is much better in English and Chinese, which are the two big languages on the internet, than it is on a lot of small languages, like, for example, for my native country of Denmark, which is very spoken by very, very few people that language. And so it's not as good in those languages. But I mean, I'm sorry to say that's just how it is. Uh, ways we can. Then, of course, knowing that, one can now start to try to work to alleviate this problem. And you can do things if you are in a country, a small language country, you can do things to kind of like make it make it better in those languages. So, so you can be aware of those things and you can you can you can work towards it. But absolutely, the AI has all the I mean, that's just actually the same stereotypes as people have, because that's how it learned. Um, but you can if you can also work work around that for example if in in pro I mean, these sort of standard examples you want an image of something or other how is that image going to look well you can make it look not exactly like you want but you can make it look a lot like what you want just by specifying i want this person to be you know an old person or a young person or this or that person you can just ask for it i mean i have to say the, the stereotypes do come into play because i once wanted you know somebody who looked like somewhat like me and so I just specify, you know, a 66 year old man who's, who's half bald. Every single picture has like a, a gray beard. I mean, gray beard is a word for a reason that symbolizes, you know, older gentleman. And uh, I couldn't get it to draw somebody who actually looks like me. So it's not like a disaster. I just put a picture in, in my article with somebody with a beard, you know, that, that that's fine. But but yeah, some, some stereotypes are so hard you can't get around them, but most of them you can actually get around if you ask the right way. So that's just a matter of you. Um, doing that. Mm -hmm. And I guess, like you say, being aware of that bias is kind of your first step in trying to yeah. counteract it. And I guess that's, that's, that's the way forward. Um, so just as a, a final question, then Jacob, um, so we have a question here asking if uh, prototyping tools, so AI prototyping tools like um, Wizard, I think it's pronounced, yeah. if they will replace UX designers um, and what new skills UX professionals should be learning to kind of 
be prepared for this new wave of of design and i think that's probably a, a good question to to finish up on good yeah, i don't know how it's pronounced either ui wizard or is or something like that yeah. uh, but there were a few of those tools that in this uh, survey that i just published today actually scored relatively high so they're definitely being used um i don't think they will replace uh, designers um, but there will definitely be a design tool that allows you again to have that twice the productivity of you did before because you don't have to scale out lower level things. And so that gives you like you need to operate at a higher level. And that means that you have to like, start thinking at a higher level as well. And that's not always easy. But uh, honestly, um, we know from studies of programmers, not of, of UX designers, but of programmers, that the AI tools allow actually already now programmers to be more than twice as productive. I mean, programming is the one thing where AI works the best because it's not like a computer thing. Um, what the studies show is actually, this means higher job satisfaction for programmers who use AI because they now don't have to worry about the lower level kind of details, like exactly how do I write the parameters for this function call, but they can focus on the higher level problems about structuring their software. They're in the flow of creating, not the nitty gritty, of of constructing the, the the little low level things and the same is true for design you you have to think less about the lower level design details because they can be taken care of for you you have to think more about the higher level design problems because that's what the ai can uh, cannot do and you can in general be most more productive more creative and i do think this this will transfer from those studies of developers higher satisfaction because you can focus on the deeper, more interesting problems, spend more of your time thinking about exciting stuff, honestly, than about nitty gritty low level stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think anybody could leave this this webinar without feeling uh, excited about all of the the possibilities. Um, honestly, Jacob, I could I could talk to you for another couple of hours on this topic, but um, that is all we have time for. Um, for today. Um, but thank you so much. It's been an absolute privilege to, to hear your perspectives on the on this topic. Um, I know to, to finish up, I'd, I'd, I'm sure the audience would love to know a bit about, you know, what you're working on at the moment and and um, your plans for UX Tigers. Um, we'll share the the link to the newsletter as well. But if if you want to, to take a moment to, to tell people what you'll be what you'll be doing next. Yeah, well, so as, as you said, my website is UX Tigers, and I publish my articles there, and I put them out in an e email as well, because that's super important. Um, and I'm really trying to get a handle on um, what does it mean for the future structure of UX in the world? I mean, I think, as I said before, many more people for sure. But how are they going to be, how is this going to be structured? And my current theory is what I call pancaking, which is less hierarchy, more broadened out and, and sort of immersed everywhere. But I'm kind of working that through. And I'm also thinking about, you know, I have the title for this article. I don't have the article, but it's like peak programmer is does not equal peak UX. And I feel like uh, the balance, the relative balance between developers and, and UX people is going to change in the future. Uh, because we absolutely need developers. I have super respect for engineers and people actually make the thing work. It ha if you don't implement it, design is for nothing, right? But because implementation is going to be easier and easier and easier, I feel like the balance between where you spend your resources in a company will tilt more in favor of what should be done, not in implementation, still has to happen, but smaller percentage on implement, more percentage on design, deciding what you do, user research, what do people even need in the first place? So that's, I'm kind of trying to work through those things that I don't have like an exact presentation on it yet, but but that's what I'm working on now. Well, it sounds really exciting and uh, uh, I'm sure everybody's gonna be looking forward to the, your next uh, email uh, coming through. And as Coleman said at the at the start of the webinar, it's, it's great to have you as a, a guide to kind of steer us through this next um, evolution in, in the industry. So um, thank you so much again, Jacob, for, for your time and for sharing um, your expertise. And thank you everybody for attending. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for staying for the full hour. Okay, thank you.